and in Nevada. A final motion hearing is set for this afternoon ahead of jury selection in the investigative reporter murder trial for Robert Tellis. The former Las Vegas politician is accused in the stabbing death of investigative reporter Jeff Garman. But let's begin in Las Vegas, Nevada, with that Robert Tellis trial. Court TV anchor Julie Grant has a look at this case against Tellis. At approximately 10.30 this morning, we received a 911 call where a person had reported that they found their neighbor deceased on the side of their house. September 3rd, 2022, 69-year-old Jeff Gehrman was found stabbed to death in his backyard. Gehrman was an investigative reporter with the Las Vegas Review Journal. One of the stories he was chasing in the months before his death was allegations of turmoil at the Clark County Public Administrator's office. Hello, I'm Rob Tellis and I'm your Clark County Public Administrator. 45-year-old Robert Tellis was in his first term as the public administrator. He was running for re-election and was at odds with some of his staff who claimed that he was a bully and played favorites in the office. We decided that we would go public. We would try to talk to a journalist here in our community and see if somebody felt it was worthy of reporting. Gehrman wrote four articles in May and June, and he stayed with the story after Tellis lost his re-election bid. Two months later, on September 2nd, 2022, Gehrman was killed. Every murder is tragic, but the killing of a journalist is particularly troublesome. Las Vegas police released surveillance video of a suspect near Jeff Gehrman's home, wearing a large straw hat and tennis shoes that matched evidence that was later recovered from Robert Tellis's home. Prosecutors also say they found Tellis's DNA on Gehrman. Tellis was upset about articles that were being written by Gehrman as an investigative journalist that exposed potential wrongdoing. Can you tell us anything? Five days after Gehrman's death, Tellis was arrested at his home after a standoff with police. He was treated for self-inflicted injuries before being booked on one count of murder. Are you familiar with the charges that you're facing? Yes, sir. After that charge, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, Your Honor. Tellis' attorney says he's innocent and that a voicemail left on Jeff Gehrman's work phone months before Gehrman was killed clears his client. I believe that this is, is exculpatory evidence. Obviously, you have a death threat directed at Mr. Gehrman back in February of 2022. If Robert Tellis is convicted, he could be sentenced to life in prison. So we are going to be watching that trial. In this hour, we are bringing you Robert Tellis in his own words. He gave an interview from jail to Scripps News Las Vegas. This was in March of 2023. And Tellis claims that he is being framed and that he is not the killer. So let's start at the beginning of his interview. Alrighty, Mr. Tellis, um, if I could just have you start off by saying and spelling your first and last name for the record, please. Absolutely. My first name is Robert. My last name is Tellis, T-E-L-L-E-S. And first name, can you spell that as well? Sure, Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T. Okay, so uh, at the end of the hearing today, you said you have an urgent concern and you asked the media to come out um, to see you today. So what is that urgent Absolutely. concern? Well, um, of course, you know, I'm happy to speak about what happened in court today, or we can go ahead and go right into that. So here's the concern that I've got. Right now, Metro is in a fight with the Las Vegas Review Journal, spending potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars in a supposed effort to get me exculpatory evidence that was on Mr. German's phone. When Metro is blocking me from getting evidence that will actually set me free today without actually having to go and, and fight the Review Journal. And, and the money that they're spending is taxpayer money. So why they're doing that instead of just giving me the evidence that'll allow me to get myself released, I don't know. But of course, I'm happy to talk about the details on that. I'll tell you the evidence relates to just pervasive, pervasive police misconduct in this case. 
By um, set me free, you mean that you would have been released from CCDC? Correct. As of right now, I was wrongfully arrested and I've been wrongfully jailed for nearly seven months. Uh, I also want to talk about what happened at the hearing today. Um, I know you spoke with me last time about why you believe Judge Levitt should be recused from your case, um, but Judge Jerry Weiss today denied your recusal. How do you feel about this? Well, honestly, to be frank, um, he really, uh, I don't know if I want to say the word is hypocritical per se, but he certainly used a standard for me that he didn't use in another case that, that he actually sat over. I talked about Debbie Pershaw. That's a case where Judge Weiss said, okay, I see that there's this conduct that makes it more likely that this person, um, this judge, it is not impartial. And it was just when this judge made some favorable comments about one side's attorney. Um, and here, again, there's, there should be no difference in the case. If there's conduct that shows that the judge is not impartial, the judge should be disqualified. But Judge Wee said, well, in, in so many words, that case was different. There's a different law that applies to that case, which, you know, the, the, the case law where he actually made that ruling says very clearly that, and then, sorry for getting technical and getting to the weeds here, but that Nevada Judicial, the Nevada Judicial Code of Conduct applies on my motion, not NRS 1.235. But the judge said, oh no, this case is governed by NRS 1.235, which again, case law says is incorrect. So it seems to me that unfortunately Judge Weiss decided that for whatever reason, he was going to go ahead and uh, hold me to a different standard. Now, I don't know. I know that he mentioned that Judge Levitt was a premier judge. I, you know, I, I didn't find anything in case law or, or statute or, or local rules that says that judges can have a premier status. But maybe premier status means that they can break the Nevada Code of Judicial Conduct. They don't have to follow case law. I don't know. But very clearly, Judge Levitt engaged in conduct that, where she said, you know, accused me of playing games. They called me a fool, basically. Told me that I was not going to do a good job. And a case that she actually cited in her affidavit stands for the proposition that you should not do any of that. You know, you do not need to make, you know, you don't need to embarrass that person to tell them it's not a good idea to represent yourself. So it, it, again, it, it was just really shocking to see that a different standard was applied, uh, one that shouldn't have been. But, you know, we're just going to go ahead and keep pushing and, and keep fighting. All right, we're hearing a lot from TELUS in that interview he did with the journalist out in Las Vegas. We do want to bring in our guest for this hour to discuss what we've seen so far, what we can expect to see in this case. Joining me now from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borchardt. Franz, all right, so we just watched TELUS. Just, he's the one that wanted the journalist to come and talk with him. He said he had some urgent concerns talking about exculpatory evidence. What's your take on what we heard from him so far? I think that a person who is accused of a crime who represents himself, even if an attorney has a fool for a client, it's a famous, it's a famous maxim, right? And I think what you're seeing is the guy that is the smartest guy in the room, who is probably better than any other attorney, is going down rabbit holes. And and look, frankly. Uh, his theory is that someone else did it, he was framed, and the other person who did it is the person that left a, a, a death threat on a phone. Well, the, the fact that there was a death threat on the phone doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else did it, doesn't mean he gets out of jail. Um, I never like it when a client or a self-representing individual uh, schedules an appointment with journalists in prison and does an interview through a glass uh, holding area. It, it's terrible optics, it's very self-serving, and it's just not a good look for him. And I think you're gonna see more of this behavior as the trial uh, starts and progresses.
And Franz, what about him wanting the judge to recuse himself? You know, he's just talking about he was citing case law, saying that he should have done it because the judge is not impartial here. I mean, that didn't happen. So the judge is not being partial if he tells him, hey, it's not a good idea for you to represent yourself. That's, by the way, a judge or anyone telling another human being, hey, it's not a good idea to represent yourself. That's like the best legal advice you <laughs> could possibly give that is seven days a week accurate. <laughs> Representing yourself is a terrible idea. The judge is not partial because he suggested that. And, and look, he's going to muck up the record as much as he can, right? We, we've seen this in pro se uh, defendants, uh, not just in this case, but there's another one floating around right now, Sarah Boone, shout out to Sarah. Um, they muck up the record. They know what they're doing. He knows what he's doing by filing any motion he can to muck up the record so as to either delay or cause issues. But ultimately at the end of the day, a lawyer who's representing him will file the necessary and appropriate motions to truly defend him. Yeah, exactly. Good points, Franz. All right, we're gonna get in a quick break, but coming up, find out what Robert Tellis claims are the so-called bad acts by Metro Las Vegas police in this investigation against him. We'll have that part of the jailhouse interview that's coming up next. It's really important for Scripps News reporters to live where they are reporting. You get to talk to people from all different backgrounds. We do stories with people regardless of the political persuasions. We're coming here as, as people, as your neighbors. We know best what's happening in our communities. And that's why I wake up every morning, is I hope I can deliver folks information so they can make an educated decision. I'm Forrest Saunders. Ben Brown. Jake Burns. Rachel Louise Just. Alex Miller. Scripps News. Watch Scripps News. Find them an antenna or on your favorite streaming app. for a Las Vegas politician accused of killing an investigative reporter who wrote articles critical of him begins today with jury selection. Robert Tellis is accused of murder with a deadly weapon for the stabbing death of Jeffrey Garman in September of 2022, a few months after his arrest. Scripps News Las Vegas interviewed Tellis from jail. Let's pick up the interview now right where we left off. So Judge Weiss said that any other judge would have acted the same way Judge Levitt did. Do you believe that's true? No, if, if you look at, again, the case, uh, Stevie Mills, that was, again, cited in Judge Levitt's own affidavit. It, there's a clear discussion about the fact that the types of comments that Judge Levitt had engaged in were inappropriate. And the fact that Judge yeah, Weiss just kind of waved away the fact that she lied, it was also a bit shocking. You know, she, she lied about the fact that I could not, she said it basically I could not terminate self-representation. When is it okay to lie to somebody in court? It's okay, as far as Judge Weiss is concerned, it's okay to lie to somebody in court if it's for their own good. And I don't think that anywhere in case law or in statute it says that that's the case. So last time you told me that uh, you do plan to get counsel eventually, what's the latest status on that? So uh, tomorrow I'm going to be filing a motion that actually lays out all the facts regarding what I've told you about the police misconduct. From the very beginning to the very end, there was misconduct. There's perjury, using illegal methods of surveillance, illegally holding me at a police station while they supposedly search my house. And, and I say supposedly because when I, I cannot personally watch that they're searching, I don't know when that supposed evidence that they've got, if it was there before, or if it got there when they started their search. Because they decided to legally hold me at, at a police station. But again, and throughout all the search warrants, through the, the declaration of arrest report, there are lies all throughout it. And tomorrow I'm going to file a pleading that's going to illustrate all those lies. And this pleading is going to be in support of getting the evidence that I've requested, but that Metro is trying to deny me. So tomorrow everyone can see all the bad acts that were 
you know, that were created by Metro during the course of investigation. Um, I know you filed 22 subpoenas, right? Uh, 20 subpoenas, correct. Uh, how would that be different from the motion that you're filing tomorrow? So that's the funny thing. I, when, I'm, when I say that, you know, I have to file this motion, I have to file the motion because Metro decided outright, they sent me a letter saying that they are not going to respond to any of my subpoenas. And so for them to say that, you know, they're not going to respond to my subpoenas, it's uh, really legally, procedurally, and ethically wrong. You know, they are supposed to have to file a motion if they disagree with any of my requests. Imagine if another organization said, oh, you know what, we're not going to go ahead, we're not going to comply with your subpoena. You go ask the judge for permission to get it. If I subpoenaed any other organization except Metro, that organization would be held to account for it. So I, I, I'm not going to be surprised if the judge does not hold Metro to account because they've decided that, you know, that they don't have to comply with the law regarding subpoenas. Um, and why they, that is, I don't know, because, again, it's, I'm looking for evidence of wrongdoing. Our, our police department should not be trying to hide evidence of bad acts. They should be counseling their, their staff against engaging in bad acts to begin with. So now I've got an uphill battle against these guys to try to just get simply the things that I need to prove that bad acts have occurred in, in this case. So you believe... And again, I... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You believe there was police misconduct? I, it, through and through. And again, the, the pleading that we're going to file tomorrow will show through and through that illegal, illegal records were obtained, a, a device was illegally used to monitor my cell phone. Um, the detective Gaddis flat out lied. And it's gonna be very clear, even though I don't have all the evidence um, from the subpoenas yet, I have, there are, there's enough that you all could independently verify that some of what I'm saying is true. So uh, I'll certainly, I'll lay that out in that pleading so that you all can independently verify that, that what I'm saying is true regarding at, at least some of these acts right now. And what was the reason behind filing your subpoenas? Was it to better um, help you represent yourself in court? So the, each one of those subpoenas has a specific purpose with respect to getting evidence to show that Detective Gaddis and Detective Jaffe knew that they were violating the law and they still did it and now they are trying to cover it up. There were lies in the, de the declaration of arrest report, there were lies in the search warrant to cover up some of the things they've done. But again, at the end of the day, once all the evidence comes out, you'll see every single one of those issues. It'll be clear as day. So it looks like the attorneys for Review Journal, they filed an emergency order to quash the subpoenas that were issued by you. How do you feel about this? So, you know, I saw the register of actions, but again, here at the jail, unfortunately, they don't deliver any mail timely. That's one of the issues I've had. You know, if the Review Journal drops that pleading in the mail, the day that they said they did, I still don't have it yet. And, and I have no reason to believe they didn't. Um, mail here at the jail, even though they claim to have a 24-hour policy, I've got that in writing, that they, they claim to forward things after 24 hours. I haven't had anything show up in, in my possession. It's typically about a week to, to get it. So I can't speak to what the RJ is saying in their motion to quash, but I'll say this. You know, I, I mean, clearly Detective Jaffe and or Detective Gaddis are informants for them or, or sources for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be trying to block these subpoenas. But at the end of the day, I don't care. Um, the motion that I'm going to file tomorrow will ex specifically exempt the, the things that the, the communication between 
those detectives and uh, and the RJ. Again, I, I am concerned with proving my innocence. I'm not concerned with trying to take down the RJ. I'm not concerned to, with trying to take down Metro or, or anybody. I I'm just I'm here wrongfully, and I want to prove it. I don't want to get home to my family. My youngest daughter, her birthday is April 5th, and you know if. If the DA sees, and my hope is that he will look at what I'm filed, he will rush to show that, or to get the evidence from Metro, and see that, again, I, I was wrongfully arrested, and hopefully expedite that and dismiss these charges so I can give my daughter a birthday hug. You know, that's, that's what I want. And the Nevada rules of professional conduct say that, you know, if there's proof that, that you know, that these charges are, are false in so many words that that the DA has a duty to 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 not pursue the conviction. Um, so again, it, it's my hope that that they stop wasting any more time and that and they just get me home where I where I belong. Still with us, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borchardt. Franz, he has so much to say. I bet once this trial gets underway, we're going to hear a lot more from him. And I would assume he's going to end up taking the stand because he just can't stop talking. So let's let's talk about the highlights. He was framed. There's police misconduct, misconduct of the judge. Uh, Metro is trying to suppress uh, potentially exculpatory evidence. Um, lying detectives, there's a cover up. He was wrongfully arrested and he insinuated uh, at one point that there was possibly the planning of evidence. All of these, if factually accurate, would be something that an, an attorney who would be representing him could, could really use to not only defend him, but possibly get him out on bond. Did you notice how when she asked him, hey, you've said that you're gonna hire an attorney, when's that gonna happen? He didn't really answer the question. <laughs> he doesn't intend to hire an attorney, no. right? Um, so, you know, when you have this many conspiracies, it becomes unbelievable. Like right. one conspiracy, maybe, but we're, as a culture, as a society that watches these cases, there's just too many conspiracies. And so I think his problem is going to be that if everybody, if everybody is at fault except him, it starts becoming a question of, well, did you really kill her? Because it can't be everybody who's who's rising up against you. And yes, he's absolutely going to testify at trial. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see on that one. But yes, I would assume we're going to hear from him. He just he wants to tell his story, so he believes that he's. Innocent, and so we'll have to see. It'll be interesting to watch, to say the least. All right, Franz, thank you so much. We're going to get in a break. Still ahead, we're going to continue to dive into these jailhouse interviews from murder trial defendant Robert Tellis. Hear what he has to say about the alleged evidence against him. This is after the break. TV. I'm Kelly Kraft, sitting in today for Ted Rollins. While we wait for the Robert Tellis trial to begin, we have been showing you moments from a key jailhouse interview that he gave to Scripps News Las Vegas. This was back in March of 2023. So let's pick it back up right where we left off. Tellis is talking about what he has planned for his defense, going into specifics about what evidence he plans to present during trial. Let's take a listen. So if you were granted those subpoenas, what do you plan to do with all of the evidence that you get granted? So uh, basically what happens is, and again, like I said, I hope I don't have to even go there. I hope that the DA will see the injustice and we can end this next week, frankly. But if, for example, for whatever reason, he says, you know what, I... I I want you to prove it to me um, in court, which, uh, again, when since I'm stuck with Judge Levitt, that's another ball of wax altogether. But, you know, if, if he says, you know, I, I, I need a ruling, um, despite the, the clear, clear misconduct that I'm going to show in my pleading tomorrow, 
then what I've got to do is I've got to take the evidence from those subpoenas. I've got to put it into a motion to suppress the alleged evidence, file it with the court, and then have a hearing on that. Um, where it basically it'll be an evidentiary hearing where I've got to show that Detective Gaddis and potentially Detective Jaffe um, lied and used illegal tactics in order to secure my arrest. Uh, th that whole process, by the end of the day, could take a month and a half. Um, so, again, like I said, I hope that I have to go there, but if I do, then, then I will. And um, so, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. No, 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 that's okay. That's all right. Um, well, first, I did want to ask you, so the family of Jeff Gearman was present in the hearing today. Were you able to see them, and what were your thoughts? No, and, and I, you know, unfortunately, I'm, you know, uh, again, I, I, they have my condolences, you know, I, this is, it's sad when anybody's life is lost, no matter what the age, you know, everybody loves somebody. Um, but, you know, I, so I, again, they, they do have my condolences, but I, I didn't kill Mr. Kerman. Um, so I remember what I was going to ask you. Uh, you said you were going to lay out um, all of the police misconduct in your motion that you plan to write tomorrow. So can you explain a little bit more about what exactly you plan to lay out? Sure. So in order for the police to get a search warrant, they've got to contact a judge and they've got to tell the judge of the facts that justify getting a search warrant. And in this case, the search warrant that led to them getting into my home was one that was signed by Judge Tierra Jones. And in the application that Gaddis did, she again misrepresented several things. First, in that application, she said that another detective gave her my phone records. Um, and these were supposedly records that show what kind of activity I was getting, like, you know, emails, text messages, um, where I was at all times for the entire day. And the police are not supposed to have access to that without a search warrant. So wherever this other detective, which I, I do believe this other detective is Detective Jaffe, but again, that's just my speculation at this point. Wherever this other Metro detective got those records, those were obtained illegally. Um, so that's the first thing. And then again, I'm, I'm going to say several different things that uh, that's where the subpoenas are going to come in. Because I never received a search warrant for these records that were supposedly obtained over a weekend, well before the search warrant for my home. Right, so, so there's that. If Metro, and remember, and here's the other odd thing is that right now Metro won't give me the search warrants. I don't know what they're trying to hide. Um, I tried to get them from the court. My investigator tried to get them from the court today. For whatever reason, they don't have them. Um, the RJ was able to get them pretty darn quick, so I'm not sure what process they were able to use to get them, but uh, I'm getting stonewalled a little bit on, on my end when I'm trying to get these things. But again, so there's that. Then there's also the, the matter, the concern that if you, supposedly one of the major reasons that, that they were able to get the search warrant is they said that I washed my Yukon, right? Um, I, I think the, they didn't quite say that because of a, a media post that they made that I washed my truck. But they said that I washed my truck and that was suspicious, that I was trying to basically destroy evidence. Um, what they failed to say was actually, I washed all three of my vehicles. I washed my wife's car, I washed my car, and then I washed the Yukon. You know, I inspected the Yukon to see if it, if it needed to be washed. And I washed all three cars. I did not clean any of the interiors of any of the cars. But in the search warrant application, Detective Gaddis said I washed one vehicle. 
in order to make my conduct look suspicious. So she lied to the judge. She perjured herself with that judge in that affidavit. You know, there's, again, the accumulation of, of all those things. Still with us, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borgard. Franz, all right, a lot of the things that he's talking about there are things that would happen necessarily before the trial. He's, he's hoping, hoping that the DA just gets rid of this case, drops the charges, doesn't even pursue this, sees the injustice here. Let me look into the crystal ball for you. It will be when the DA doesn't agree with him, it will be that the DA's office is in on it too and <laughs> conspiring against him. That's the crystal ball prognostication I'm gonna give you because candidly, it's just too much. Like, and the other thing is, let's not lose sight of the fact that the illegally con the illegally obtained records, his, his assertion that these are unconstitutionally obtained records may be highly inculpatory and point the finger at him. And he's talking about him in this interview and it, it's okay. You don't get it both ways, right? You don't get to say that these records that may show that you did something, you know, were illegally obtained while simultaneously saying that you're innocent in a way that no other human being has ever been innocent in the right? It's just bad optics. And and like the more he talks, by the way, everything he's saying in this interview can be used against him later. If he ever testifies, everything he ever says out loud can be used against him. So, you know, it, it, look, if you, if you, if you try to make a circus, you're going to get some clowns. And I, I just, I, I don't think this is going to play out well for him. And Franz, when he was talking about the victim, the journalist asked him, you know, what would you say to the victim's family here? Watching him, it was like he was even struggling, saying, uh, you know, it's always hard when someone was lost. Did you get any sense from him when he was talking about that? I, I think you have an individual that, that, that probably suffers from some narc from some good old fashioned narcissism. Look, a lot of us attorneys have narcissism as, as, a, as a major defect of character. This guy's on extra. So I, I think it's hard for him to care about other people besides himself. And, and look, it's all about him, right? And that is gonna be something that we see, that's gonna be something that a jury sees. And I think you're absolutely right. When talking about the victim, the actual person who's a victim in this case, he's trying to make himself a victim. Uh, Ellis is trying to make himself a victim, but look, at the end of the day, he doesn't really look like he has remorse. And the remorse he needs to have is that this guy is, was, is dead, he was killed, and that by prosecuting Ellis, they're not gonna get the right guy for the for the crime. That's the remorse he needs to be showing. He's not showing that. He is just like, it's all over the place. Yeah, does seem like that. All right, Franz, thank you so much. Still ahead, defendant Robert Tellis continues to tell his story to Scripps News Las Vegas. Hear him detail what he thinks about the police investigation into him and the reporter's death. This is after the break. Was a reporter brutally murdered for digging too deep? His death was absolutely devastating. The suspect, a former politician and subject of the victim's story on corruption. Can you tell us anything? Now will Robert Tellez go from elected official to convicted killer? Once all the evidence comes out, it'll be clear as day. Is it possible that bad press is a motive for murder? The investigative reporter murder trial. Live coverage begins this week on Court TV. to Nevada now where we have been watching a 2023 jailhouse interview with defendant Robert Tellis as we await his murder trial to get underway in Las Vegas. Let's pick it up right where we left off. Tellis is talking to a Scripps News Las Vegas reporter about the police investigation into Jeff German's death. And I'm sorry, there's one other thing that when they supposedly saw me engaging in suspicious activity by washing the outside of my car, they said that they used, well, that they were able to monitor my signal on my phone and that it dropped out while I was washing my car. And so that leads me to believe one of two things. Either someone gave them updated records, again, without a search warrant, or they used a stingray, a, a cell site simulator 
but they would have used that without a search warrant as well. And, and frankly, I think it was a, a stingray because they said that my phone turned off while I was washing the cars. And I never turned my phone off. My phone might have jumped over to Wi-Fi, which would cut off the cell signal to their device. And so they wrote in that, in that search warrant application that my phone got turned off while I was washing my cars to say that that was something that was somehow suspicious. How me, you know, and then again, why I would turn off my phone while I'm washing my car, how that would benefit me in, in, in some kind of sneaky evidence destruction, it, it just doesn't make any sense. But it, these are all like false things they put together in this search warrant application to, to basically say that I engaged in this activity that was so suspicious that, that they needed to get in my house. And then so the next day, you know, I got pulled over very early in the morning when I was trying to, when I was taking my son to school, I was on my way back, uh, three cars pulled me over, uh, three police cars. And I sat there for about an hour and I had no idea what was going on. I asked, you know, I said, I need to go home. I need to take my other children to school. Please let me go. Tell me what this is about. They refused to tell me. About an hour later, Detective Gaddis shows up with that search warrant. Um, and in the declaration of arrest report, she claims that she actually got that search warrant well before the traffic stop even occurred. If she did, why did she have, you know, six men standing around waiting for me, just sitting there? You know, I am pretty certain that, that she, she lied about the timing on the search warrant. So that's, again, another one of the um, subjects of the subpoena for her to prove when she actually got that search warrant. Because I doubt she would make all these guys sit around for an hour when she had the search warrant well in advance of the traffic stop. And, and again, the declaration of arrest report makes it sound like she was there the whole time. And that's just not true. And there are other lies throughout the rest of the search warrants I could go on and on. Like I said, one of the most egregious things is, is the fact that they held me in that police station illegally when I don't know what they were really doing in my home. You know, they claimed that they were just going to go ahead and, and nicely go through my house. They weren't going to make a mess out of it. When I got home before they arrested me later, it was as though my, my house was just taken flipped upside down and shook. It was a complete mess. You know, it, it was just upsetting. You know, and, you know, the, the fact that, and there's, again, there's just so much that I could go on and on about what happened, but, again, the, the, the corrupt activities go from end to end, and I'm going to show that in, in the motion tomorrow. Police also at the time claimed that they um, found self-inflicted wounds. Um, how, do, how do you explain this portion? Yeah, and, and that's again something that I had addressed myself um, in another interview. You know, uh, folks you just don't understand what's, what's going through a person's mind when, when you're under heavy, heavy stress, right? Um, to say that, oh, well, he hurt himself because he knew he was guilty. I think that's a that's not a, a that's not a fair thing to say. It's it's a sign of hopelessness when someone does it. You know, obviously, as I was sitting there at at the police station, worried about things, it's scary. They claim that I did this. They claim that they had proof that I did it. You know, and when the police, again, you've heard the expression, when there's smoke, there's fire, right? When they say they got the goods on you, whether it's true or not, that's scary. And so, you know, I maintain my innocence. I did that day. I even told Detective Jeffy that day. But, again, it was such a, a harrowing, stressful moment. I, I wasn't sure that I'd ever be able to prove that I was innocent. And so, uh, 
I made a decision that, that I regret, and thankfully I'm, I'm still here, and I'm and here to tell the truth and, and fight. Um, so last time we talked, you told me that uh, the biggest reason you weren't able to get a new lawyer was because you didn't have the money for it. So what's the latest status on uh, getting a grant so that you can get new counsel? Um, I do plan to go through that motion earlier evidentiary hearing if I can't prove the rampant, but the misconduct that will set you. But if you know they don't see, if Judge Levitt doesn't see that they're going to have to go to the Supreme Court, at which case I don't know that I'll have the you know the from in here to get that done. I uh, own that, like I said before, we're, we're heavily encumbered, heavily encumbered. Um, I, they still haven't sold yet, so I still don't have that money. Um, and even once I get that money, I expect I'll have somewhere around 150, far more than that. But I, again, after I, I'm, you know, show the court that I shouldn't be here. Are you in the process of selling your property right now? Uh, yes, it's well. They're listed. Um, the interest as of yet, uh, will be in Arkansas, are currently uh, the Las Vegas Review Journal did a trying to allege that I was going to get five hundred thousand dollars out of it. But again, I I had mentioned very early on when it's about three hundred thousand dollars. If I sell them at, at five hundred thousand. Let's bring in my guest for this hour to discuss. Joining me now from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borgard. Franz. You know what, tell us needs, we should get a fun goon. You know, the irony behind all, whether or not he is in fact indigent or not, if you're incarcerated for say seven months, you are presumed indigent, poor. And you're presumed by the court to not be able to, to and the court, by the way, spends all day, seven days a week doing criminal law. Who would be at you? and you don't have to pay them, and they're probably a true believer and are willing to zealous is, and I, it's abundantly clear, and they're gonna, they're gonna agree with me. And if they don't, why not, why not put your best foot forward with someone who does this area of law? And look, he himself said, stress and trauma of being in this, and yourself the kind of stress and trauma of wanting to hurt yourself or actually hurting yourself. There's a reason why we, we for poor people, for people who can't afford it, if his cases and if his legal objective attorney, great argument and possibly get his charges dismissed if in fact they're valid, if in fact there's credibility behind them. He's on Mars, we're on earth, he will be tried on. <laughs> Again, and doesn't stop, it does kind of seem that way. Listen to the, last. finish up this interview with TELUS. And so, again, the truth, this is what I got. And uh, how many properties do you own in Arkansas? Well, really, um, one's in total, um, 830000 So my hope out of the properties that will give me that money. Um, if for some reason the market's going to sell them for even less, hire an attorney. Judge Love case, but that's not going to have case. So my hope is that... You know, I I know what I'm doing, and that you know I'm well aware that I've got my rights, and that she should follow the law. Now, um, judge who west of the Mississippi overturned, um, she's pretty darn close, um, and it's my understanding that she's her cases are overturned or her decisions are overturned because she violates constitutional rights of. Of defendants, right? So, you know, my hope that she was it, so that I don't have going all the way to the Supreme Court to get her overturned in my case too. So, um, I, I will just go ahead and for now move forward. Um, I may or may not uh, do a judicial conduct complaint. So, ability in the future that you would go to the Supreme Court to file a complaint. Would, there's filing the complaint with a judicial ethics committee, um, and there's also the option to file a writ to tell the Supreme Court or ask the Supreme Court to to tell um, Judge Weiss that Judge Levitt does need to be disqualified. Now, if if it gets to the point where Judge Levitt does 
flaunt the law. She decides that, you know, there was no police misconduct in this case. Then I have to go for a writ because that writ is going to have to tell, you know, everybody that, you know, this is misconduct. And because it's misconduct, any alleged evidence that came from the, this misconduct needs to be thrown out. So ultimately, if, if she's not impartial, as she says she's going to be, then I will be going to the Supreme Court. I'm going to have to. All right, Mr. Tullis, anything else you'd like to add? No, again, I'm just hoping to, to prove that, again, all along I've been wrongfully jailed and I miss my family. We've all suffered so much and, and I'm just looking forward to, to getting home. Uh, thank you very much for the time. All right, Mr. Tullis, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you. You have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, still with us, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Franz Borgert. All right, Franz, he's saying that if the judge, if Judge Levitt does not find police misconduct, then he's going to say there's judicial misconduct. Well, he's also saying that essentially she's not the worst judge this side of the Mississippi, but she's up there, right? That she, she rules unconstitutionally all the time. Tell us how you really feel about the judge who you are praying asking for relief from. Tell us in a recorded interview how you feel about this judge so that later when she doesn't rule in favor of you, you can double down on how unjust and unconstitutional she is. Who in their right mind, even if I thought you were a terrible person, who would say it out loud and let it be recorded when you're the decision maker in my in case? I, I just, I like, what? So yeah, threatening her, because let's not mince words, he's saying if she doesn't rule in my favor, she doesn't follow the law, doesn't rule in my favor, I'm gonna have to report her mm -hmm. to the judiciary. I'm threatening her, recorded threat. I mean, this guy is, ugh. Uh, so, and the problem and the unfortunate reality is he may have some legitimately good defenses that are going to get lost in the circus that he's trying to create. That's mm -hmm. the unfortunate reality. Yeah, I mean, he could have some sort of defense here, but yeah, he's just saying so much and making threats, like you said, with the judge. And yeah, I mean, it's just kind of going to set, it's not setting a very good stage for him. So we're going to see what happens. Jury selection is going to be coming up. Thank you, Franz. And